Hi, I'm Carol Peters and I'm the owner of Slow Turtle Farm LLC. We raise goats, we milk goats, and we manufacture cheese for the human industry. We're one of only two grade A goat dairies in the entire state of Florida. We are the youngest goat dairy in the state of Florida, but we have the largest amount of animals that we're milking with my husband and I. We hope to continue to grow with the state and create an industry here. So when you say grade A, it's the same thing as USDA grade A? We are USDA grade A. We are working on our bottling license, something that we didn't really plan on doing, but is a value added. But we manufacture cheese. We, we manufacture for restaurants. We do stores. Uh, we do farmer's markets. So we go directly to the customer where they can sample their cheese and pick out what they want that week. And it's a lot of fun. Um, and this is how we pay for our animal feed. Um, it's not something that is born to, oh, I'm going to make a whole bunch of money uh, making cheese. It was, how can I support this number of animals? What do I need to do to, to keep me going with goats? And that's how we did that. So um, how did you and your husband get started? It was mostly me. My husband's a fireman, now retired. And I got cancer in 2005 and was not going to be allowed to bush hog our back field. We did have fields at one point. And so I got six goats, didn't know anything about them. <laughs> and I had a little bit of farm background um, as a high schooler. I lived on a farm for a, a year. And I fell in love and wanted to just go right back to it. We, I, my foster family was like, goats, goats. We had cows. We never had goats. Why goats? I don't know. They just appealed to me. They're, they're intelligent. They're beautiful. They're just a, a wonderful creature. And I just want to promote them as best I can. How many years have you been running the, the goats we, here? decided to make a dairy in 2011 and that's when I incorporated and it's taken us until 2020 to actually become grade A, uh, one piece of equipment at a time, mm -hmm. uh, setbacks, growth, setbacks, growth. It's not easy to create an industry where there hasn't been an industry in the past and so we there's no loans. There's, you know, you could do the USDA Farm Service Agency uh, type beginning farmer loans, but because it was dairy goats and we had nothing to measure what the impact would be in the community as far as product, which is what they're looking for. And the USDA does not measure goat cheese as a commodity. There was no ability to get loans that way. Uh, traditional banks are not a venture situation. That's venture capital that you're looking for and banks don't do that. Um, so when my husband finally retired two years ago, we made a huge push. Let's get it. Let's get it done and let's get it moving. And then COVID hit. <laughs> In the middle of all of it, we were supposed to be done in 2019, just after Christmas, everything was going to be done, and we were scheduling our final uh, inspections and so forth, and trying to get the labs out here, and the things got pushed out, things got pushed out, and then all of a sudden, in, Mar in February, they said, we know we were supposed to come out in March, but due to COVID, we're shut down, so we'll see you sometimes after May and I was like but how am I supposed to keep my animals fed in all that time and they're like not our problem which technically it's not I mean it, everybody was struggling at that point nobody knew what was going on um, so we just dealt with it and we dealt with it as best we could which is one bale of hay at a time keep milking try to work as best we could farm gate pickups you know this is what we have to offer come pick it up at the gate then we 
the farmer's markets opened back up. So we started the farmer's markets, the restaurants opened back up. So I was slogging out there, introducing ourselves to all the different chefs. So even though we began in 2020, this year is the year we actually were able to get out there and, and ply our trade. During COVID, let me add, a lot of the farmers and ranchers we've talked to had a spike in business because when the shelves were empty in the grocery stores, people that they had never sold products to started calling them up. And some people don't realize, hey, I want to buy this. And they said, well, I've been, this is all spoken for. Well, when could you have more? And they said, well, this cow or this sheep or whatever right. animal has to go through the process of growing. And some people don't realize that. So during COVID, did you see a little bit of pickup in your uh, business for either goat milk or some of the cheese? Some or? of the milk picked up, um, not so much for the pasteurized human grade, but for the raw, because they were having problems finding pet food. So people who were breeding dogs and so forth were really spiking on the, on the milk situation. The cheese, not so much, it, even though there is a huge growth in goat cheese as a product that people serve, it's still not that well known here. So what fighting the education process as well as uh, all the other things, um, goat cheese is not usually something that's in the case of dairy products anyway. So you have a, the specialty aisle and people kind of gloss over that. They don't see it. They've, they're headed to the deli or they're headed to the bakery and they walk right past the, the specialty cheeses, the sheep cheeses, the, the imports, the goat cheeses. Um, so it's been an education process. So we didn't really see a spike in that at all. Um, we did see a spike in goat meat. Um, so once the slaughter facilities started opening up, the smaller ones, we were able to take some of the boys that we were unable to sell and take those. So we had a spike in the um, ethnic population for goat meat, um, which has been, which helped. It was huge as far as being able to get um, continue buying hay for the rest of the herd. So do normally, do you uh, sell goat meat as well? We or? do. Um, it's very seasonal. We don't just go, okay, you're going to the slaughterhouse today because these are valued members for the, the dairy. Um, but we do raise boys um, up that are not going to be herd sires. We do weather a few for the pet people. Um, but having a bat growing well and having a bad moment um, is a bigger kindness than it is to go into a situation where they're um, just stuck out in a pasture eating grass that has no nutrition. <laughs> so uh, tell me um, what kind of goats that you have here. We have uh, dairy goats. We have uh, several breeds of dairy goats. These are all the larger breeds. There are um, quite a few that are recognized by the American uh, Dairy Goat Association. The Nubians are some of the most popular that people know about the most. The Sonnens, which are our white goats. Alpines, which have upright ears. And then we have a few La Mancha, which are one of the only breeds, actually the only breed, that was ever developed in the United States back in the 1970s. Uh, in California, and it is a true breed. There's also Toggenbergs, Oberhasleys, Sables, the Nigerian Dwarfs, and the now British Guernseys have been recognized with the American uh, Dairy Goat Association. Uh, so that's been um, wonderful for that industry. And keeping the, them pure or American, 100% uh, of their breed, but have been bred up from something else even though multiple generations have to pass before they become a uh, breed standard. Um, so are, of the breeds that you mentioned, are there a particular one that is your best milkers as far as uh, getting X amount of pounds of milk from them? We don't, because we're cheese manufacturers, we're not looking so much for quantity, but quality. So we have the mixed herd one because I just couldn't resist this one and that one. But we also breed genetically for the best cheese making milk. And the Nubians have um, the second highest butter fat ratio. They have alpha casein proteins. Um, you hear about the A1, A2 genes with milk and inflammation responses. Well, breaking that down 
into the different components, the alpha casein is what makes the cheese or fluid milk um, taste creamy or watery or so forth. The Sonnens um, are a good milk breed. They give the most milk for, per breed um, on average, but they have the, the lowest amount of cheese making butter fats. Um, the Nubians have the highest butter fat. They don't make as much quantity of milk. So we blend the milk and we have a really nice component that makes a beautiful cheese. It also makes a nice, rich, creamy milk, um, very different from cow's milk. Uh, people who drink it um, can't believe how silky it feels on the tongue, but oh my gosh, it tastes just like milk. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so it's a little easier to process for some people too. It actually right? is. It most closely resembles human milk um, in that the molecules are that much smaller. Uh, cow's milk has to be homogenized, meaning the cells have to be broken up. So those, back in the day, you used to have to shake your milk to be able to put the butter fats back into the milk before you drank it. With goat's milk, you don't need to do that so much because the creme line stays within the milk suspended um, and not rising to the surface like the old fashioned milk. Um, so we, they consider it naturally homogenized uh, because of those small particles. It's easier to digest. Be, going back to the cow's A1, A2 genes, goats are always A2. There is no A1 gene in goat's milk. So people who think that they're lactose intolerant may actually be A1 intolerant and have that inflammation response in their body that is um, very uncomfortable, <laughs> to say mildly. Here in the United States, we don't, you know, we still, everyone hasn't come around to goat milk or goat cheeses or meat in particular. It's more of a, a lot of that is still, as you were saying, an ethnic market. It's a very ethnic market. The, the United States is one of the only places in the world that does not recognize goats for the value that they are. Goat meat in itself is higher in protein than beef is, yet it's lower in fat than chicken. It's a very, very lean, very healthy meat um, of all the red meats. It's delicious. It should be a mild tasting meat. It's not as gamey as say uh, lamb or venison. Um, we use it uh, plain. We make steaks, chops, we braise it, we uh, barbecue. Um, but because of its leanness, people in the United States don't know how to treat it. It's a low and slow process. Uh, you have to add either fats in it if you're going to cook it quickly. But in the braising process, adding liquids, adding oils, marinades, and so forth, it breaks down those fibers, adds enough uh, fats to it that makes a beautiful, beautiful meat. Um, as far as goat's cheese goes, most of the goat cheeses that you get um, commercially have been processed in a large commercial facility. It's either ultra pasteurized or it's had time um, before it gets turned to cheese or just the cheese itself has aged for a bit, especially the fresh cheeses. It's not supposed to be an aged cheese, it's fresh. It breaks down those casein proteins and a fresh cheese is mild and flavorful. Um, and the creamy. chefs call it that a barnyard flavor, but it's not rank. It's not something that you go, oh gosh, that's, I guess I can swallow that maybe. Um, it should be, oh my God, this is wonderful and feel the components in it. Um, the hard cheeses, you should not be able to distinguish a Gouda from either sheep or cow or goat other than just the, the texture. Um, the flavor itself, a Gouda should taste like Gouda. <laughs> cheddar of cheddar, mozzarella, mozzarella, um, and be able to work it that way. Um, any kind of milk can be made into any kind of cheese, um, but how it's digested, how the flavor components work themselves with foods. Goat's milk does well with acid-based foods, so it pairs beautifully with fruits. 
um, with certain vegetables. Um, it does do well as a complement with meats, but it's also great for desserts. We, there's a restaurant in Mount Dora that uses pounds and pounds and pounds of our goat cheese for their cheesecakes. It makes a wonderful, mild flavored cheesecake that doesn't have quite the density that you would find with the cream cheese from cow's milk. So people are just shocked at how beautiful it makes it. Do you process and make your cheeses here or do you? Uh, we you do. Would, we okay. make our cheeses all right here on the farm. So the goats get milked. It goes right into a bulk tank. From the bulk tank, we transfer it to our pasteurizer and we make cheese. When we're in peak season, we make cheese every single day. And then in slow times right now, we're barely making enough for just our own table. We're waiting for these girls to come in online. We've frozen curd for our wholesale clients, whatever's left over in our freezers for our farmer's markets. And it's like, hold on guys, just wait, just wait. A well, <laughs> couple more weeks. <laughs> explain this to me people that may not know too because you know a, a goat has to have a baby, baby to lactate most of the time you need to have a baby to lactate we do have goats that become precocious they start making an udder before they have babies once in a while we'll milk those if it's they're really desiring to make milk but most of the time they have to be pregnant they go through the hormonal process of giving birth and then they start making milk to feed their babies um, which we allow them to do we allow them to feed their babies when the babies get big enough usually between one and two weeks old we'll pull the babies at night because they're sleeping We'll put them in a nice safe location. We milk the moms in the morning, and then there's still plenty for the babies all day long until evening again when the babies know to go get put up. They get their hay. They don't have to fight for it with their moms. And the next morning we milk again and they get reunited with their moms. They spend their lives with their family units. Tell the gestation period on, on the goat. It's 150 days, give or take five days. Uh, we don't really like them going over. Once in a while they will, um, but it's pretty much like clockwork at 150 days. And because we do breedings um, by schedule, when they come into a heat cycle, just when they're going through ovulation, we will introduce them with a buck. We'll let them breed for an hour or more, and then we'll take the buck back to his pen and say good boy <laughs> and the girl and then we wait for 150 days. Um, we used to keep it all track of it on a little handy calendar that I would keep in the barn. Now I have to have an Excel spreadsheet on my <laughs> phone that I input all the dates on and it will calculate all the, the kidding seasons. <laughs> well now you mentioned earlier about registering your animals. Mm -hmm. Tell me why that's important. One is for the betterment of the dairy goat industry. The American Dairy Goat Association keeps track of the history of each one of the goats that are born in the United States. And for showing, for pedigree, for lineage, um, they go through the same process that cows do for linear appraisal. Um, we are, uh, or can, do the um, DHI, Dairy Herd Improvement Registry, where you actually measure the milk, the butterfats, the solids, over a period of time, not just the lactation of each individual animal, but the entire family of animals, so people can make better breeding choices based on the type of stock they bring in. Kind of like you do with bulls, and in the dairy, in the dairy cow industry, is they are selecting the sire for the best outcome. If they have a trait that they're trying to work on, say the, they need more prominent wider chests. So you bring them in a bull that has been typically known to give that type of thing to their offspring, so you're breeding a better animal. And to do that, each animal has to be designated with some kind of number. So the American Dairy Goat is an industry assigns them a registration number that is unique to them for their entire lives. They're tattooed with an identifier for us for being able to identify them as well as just knowing who they are. Um, and so we show them. We want them to showcase those. So when we do sell offspring, we sell them to show homes that are also looking to better their uh, stock. 
we um, used to do the linear appraisal programs and the DHI were a little too big and too new to get back into it. It is an expensive process, um, but it, it's nice to be able to pick out those lineages. Well, and you're also wanting to keep those lineages, but also make sure you're not breeding a father to a daughter. Actually, and... that's something that you do um, yeah. occasionally. It's mm -hmm. not like with humans. Um, it, t there's, there's a kind of a saying, line breeding is doing it when it works, and inbreeding is when it does not. Um, you, If you're not quite sure of what traits will bring to your herd, you want to do a father-daughter or a mother-son or sometimes even siblings. Um, they're not bringing in a 50% or a 100% back in. It's only a very slight percentage. So tell me about all the products that people could get from your farm and where they might get them and, and how they can follow you and keep up. You can follow me on pretty much any social media. We did have a website there, um, shut down that, and so we're in transition to building a new website. Uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, um, not so much Twitter, not quite as much Instagram. I'm a Facebooker, I'm learning. <laughs> um, and uh, you can get our, farm, our products here at the gate. You can just text or shoot me a message through one of the social media programs and be able to say, hey, I want this, that, and the other thing, and, and be able to pick it up at the gate. You can go to the farmer's markets. We do the Deland Artisan Alley Farmer's Market. We do Monday night in um, Audubon Park Community uh, Market that's in the Stardust parking lot on Monday nights. Every other week, we are in New Smyrna Beach, and then we will post that we're doing specialty pop-ups. One, uh, once a month, we do Central 28 Beer Company over in DeBerry. Uh, we do a pop-up at Pet Supply Plus um, for their pet uh, people. We'll bring a, a product, uh, a lot of raw milk for the dog food people. Um, we do the specialty areas. We did the Longwood Art Show. Um, in their food system. We do the Blueberry Art Festival right here in Mount Dora. That's a big hit because we source our blueberries locally through Atwood Farms. Um, and that's one of the other things that we do with our cheese is as many local products as we can to support other farmers. We do, we source our bacon locally in Lake County. We source our honey from Lake County. We source our blueberries here from Lake County. Um, we're looking for our herbs. Uh, a lot of herbs we get is uh, from Seminole Springs uh, that's right around the corner. She's less than two miles away that grows the herbs for our cheeses. Um, so we try to support as much as we can, keep everything fresh and as, as we possibly can. When we do um, do some of our harder cheeses, I want to partner with some of the wineries that are around here for the grape leaves and for doing some of the uh, wine uh, rubbed uh, cheeses that we plan on doing in the future and keep it all local and healthy and wonderful for all the other farmers as well as ourselves.